do, it's going to take time and resources to do. And so in order to speed up our scripts, what we're going to be looking at is how can we ask the computer to accomplish the same thing but do it with less work, less effort. And there are a lot of opportunities that do come up. Um, once we find a speed up opportunity, we're going to want to apply one or more uh, techniques to it to get us to a faster speed. These questions, these, these uh, three questions down at the bottom here. Uh, what does it cost of my computer to perform this command? Anytime we tell a computer to do anything, we should be thinking in terms of what am I actually asking it to do? Is there another way to do it? What other, do I have all, all other alternatives? And is there a less resource intensive way to do this? A lot of what this boils down to is a very simple principle. We saw it happen here in this room tonight. Uh, it's all over the place. When you order food, it takes less time for a restaurant to, to prepare a little bit of food than a whole bunch. So if you order, a, you put in a small order, you're going to get that faster than somebody that, that's asking for two or three plates of food. Building a house for a given the size of construction crew, a small house takes less effort and time to build than a larger one. If you're sawing up a tree for firewood, you can saw up a smaller tree a lot faster than a larger tree. I mean, these are you know, very simple concepts, but we can use that concept as a crowbar to pry open opportunities to speed up the script. Let's look at that. Okay. What we're doing here, these four lines do exactly the same thing, but they take a, a different approach, each one. And just so everybody's on the same page, what we're doing is taking the data that's in this file, we're feeding it into the sort command. With this option, we are deleting any duplicate lines, and we're redirecting it to a text file output. This sort is doing the same thing, except with that bar option, it's going to put it in the reverse order. So these two files are going to have the same data in them, but they're going to, one's going to be the reverse of the other. The first line, we've got two reads, two sorts, and it's going to discard the duplicates after sorting. This next line is how we, okay, we ask ourselves the question, how can we accomplish the same thing while asking less of the computer? It takes more time to read a file twice than it does to read it once. And so we ask ourselves, can we make it so that we only have to read it once? Well, this is how we can do that. We're still generating our output file there, and we are generating our second file, but we're, we're not having to read the file twice. So, this line, line two, is faster than line one. We don't know exactly how much, but it is going to be faster because we're asking the computer to do less. The third line, we're going to ask the same question. How can we accomplish the same thing, but with asking the computer to do less? This is the difference between these two lines. Instead of sorting, reverse sorting that data stream, it's already sorted if we acknowledge the fact that this file and this file are reverses of each other, we can use the tap command, which is cap. All it does is list out the lines, but it's does so backwards. So listing the lines backwards is less resource intensive than, do, than, than doing a complete new sort on it. And so again, we have reduced the amount of effort the computer has to perform. The fourth line, this strange looking thing is an associative array. All it does is look at each line as it's coming in and it says, if I've seen this line before, I don't pass it on. And so it's eliminating any duplicates right there. And so it's cutting in half the amount of data, total data that the, that the pipeline has to do. And then the rest of it is the same as the line before. And so at each step, we have reduced what the computer has to do. If 50% of the lines are duplicates, 
This line is almost 10 times faster than that one. Well, if anybody's got any questions, just raise your hand and we can address them. We're using the same ideas in the last line as in the first, but we're doing them in a different order and in a different way. And that's what the point we want to get to. What's the best way to use the ideas that are going to make this thing work? Okay, let's change, change gears here. Anytime the shell has to put a value into a, a variable, recall a value from a variable, manipulate it in a variable, we're asking the computer to do more than maybe what it needs to do. If we come up with a way to eliminate the need for the variable altogether, then we can speed things up. Each one of these lines, um, okay, one of the ways that variables are commonly used is you execute one or more commands, put the results in a variable, and then use that variable in another command. This shows various ways you can embed a command within another command and eliminate the need for the variable altogether. Every time you cut out another variable, you're going to speed up your script because you're asking the computer to do less. Also, we want to focus on commands that lend themselves to pipeline. Uh, here, this is an interesting thing I wanted to, to point out. Fine has a lot of different options. It is extremely powerful in what it's able to, uh, the kind of decisions it's able to do on the files that it's looking at. But the disadvantage of find is it's going to dig through all the files of whatever you point to, whether it's the, the bar file system or the root file system or whatever. If you use the locate command as a front end to find, you can a lot of times locate the, the files you're interested in much more quickly. This is on the order of milliseconds send it to grep to, to uh, pick up um, only the, the files, we're looking for JPEG files here, and then feed those, the output of that, into find. Here we're looking for JPEG files that have ZCZ in the back that are over 100K in size. This is going to run a lot faster than if you just say find and then look through root because we're asking the computer to do less. It's already got those names in a database. I found between a 10 times and a 70 times general factor, speed factor, between a variable-oriented type of approach and a pipeline-oriented approach. If you need to use a sh uh, an explicit shell loop of some sort, like here's the, the for do done loop, you can actually pipe right into it. And this allows the for command to pick up the items directly out of the incoming data stream. Operate on them with whatever commands you want, and then uh, assuming each of those have some sort of an output, that output will go to the output side of the pipeline. So you can actually have a pipeline, a 4x or a, a, a 4x loop in it, and then continue on with the pipeline. This allows you to briefly break out in the middle of a pipeline in, in this type of a loop, execute the commands, and then send it on. Is this, this making sense? Here we have a, a while loop. We have three items per line in the incoming stream. We're assigning those variable values. We can execute commands on those. We can even, even pipeline more things after this if we went to. And here, here again, we're uh, just letting everything go to the output side to the point where uh, the next thing in the pipeline will grab those, that, that data is generated. Here's an actual example of that. Um, 
in my uh, current engagement, I use this approach every day in, in the stuff that I run because I'm dealing with uh, about 1,100 hosts, most of them Linux, some of them AIS. Um, here I have a list of host names that is a mixture of different uh, host types. I'm deleting any comment, any commented things, <laughs> deleting any empty lines. Here, this is a very quick way to compare an input, a piece of input data to a list. This is the list of my Linux hosts. If the host name is not in this list, it doesn't pass it on. But if it is in this list, it does. Then it reads the host name, and then these two lines are output. Then I go out to the, the actual host, grab the host file, tag the beginning of the file with file one colon. So when I analyze this file, I'm going to be able to tell which uh, host it came from and which file it came from. Here I'm going to uh, do the same thing with the result.com file. And all that stuff goes to the output. Here, I'm going to take that same output file. I'm going to translate all of the spaces and tabs to a single space. It says squeeze. So any, any uh, number of spaces or tabs are going to, be, going to end up as just a single space. So I end up with a space delimited line for however many items are in that line. I'm going to pull out the, uh, the uh, name of the host and any line that came from the resolve.com file that has that starts with the word name server. And this is a way to uh, print out the host file, a colon, and what was second in the name server line, which was the IP of the name server. So what you end up here with is a list of host name, colon, and then the IP address of however many name servers it uses. So you can very quickly see, do I have, uh, you can go through here and look for obsolete IP addresses for name servers or whatever. This is how you can use stream processing to do a, a lot of stuff uh, very rapidly and end up with a report. And this down here is what you would do with the code modification to make this feed directly into that so that it's all one piece, all one uh, pipeline piece of code. Any questions or anything? Okay. Um, one of the big things that I found out when I was writing the book was some commands are tremendously or dramatically faster at executing than others. Uh, in particular, the translate command, TR, right here, if you want to delete or change a particular character or a group of characters to some, some other character, this is the fastest way to do this. To, to do that sort of thing, the TR, that's going to be on the order of 50 times faster than Sarah Hawk doing the same thing. And so knowing that this is that much faster, if you if you know you can do a certain thing with TR or with Sarah Hawk, you go for the command that's higher in the list, you're going to end up with a faster script. I got a question for you. Yes. Did you learn all this when you wrote the book, or did you know this before you wrote the book? I learned this in the process of writing the book. I started testing. Actually, I stumbled on this stuff. I was, my, my first intent in writing the book is to come up with a thousand one-liners and just put it out there. I thought, uh, four months after tops. Well, it took a lot longer to get to 1,000. But then in the process of testing, these one-liners, uh, as I was writing, because I didn't want to put a bunch of garbage in the book, just about everything's tested, I found that some of these 
ways of doing things were a whole lot faster than others. I mean, we're talking orders of magnitude faster. There's one case where it was one command was more than a thousand times faster than a certain other couple commands. We'll look at that later. And so I thought, I, I, I don't see anybody else teaching this stuff. I don't see anybody else writing about it. I think it's important for somebody to know that command X is 500 times faster than command Y, doing the same thing. I mean, if I'm writing software, I want to know stuff like that. And so I changed the focus of the book, and it added probably three years to <laughs> time alone. It took the right. But what I wanted to end up with was something that I could be proud of and that I could enjoy using myself. My first customer for my book was me. And since I do consulting work and I'm writing scripts almost daily, uh, I had uh, immediate and constant application for that. So I ended up, uh, I, I stumbled across it, and then when I, when I found out what I had, I thought, people need to know this. And that's why the, the, the book took the direction of it. That's what, when it became the high performance shell script reference. Outstanding. Another question for you. Um, yes. How do you measure the speed difference? Did you run time before that, or did yes? Okay. I actually ran a script. In fact, I have a copy of the script in the book. Um, that I would usually have two, three, or four different approaches. And I, what the script would do, I automated the whole thing. It would run each of these alternative ways to do it with the time command, it would log the, the, the results. I'd run each one 20 times, round robin, okay. throw out the first attempt to, so it wasn't skewed. So everything, if I was reading a file, it was all in the buffer, it made a level, level playing field. And then I had that fit into another script that analyzed everything and said, okay, approach number three is the, the fastest, and then it compared everything to that. And so I ended up, with a fairly large table of um, uh, tabulated data. This approach is faster than that approach and so forth. And that's where that, a lot of that came from. Do you have facilities of 20 different problems were you using different sizes of input or was it the same input for each run? It was the same input for each one. So that I, I did everything I could think of to level the playing field so that every command had exactly the same conditions <laughs> As every other. Okay. Uh, another thing, I also wondered, did, was it all the same machine then for each test then? Yes. Okay. Wondering if like file systems, like if you're using XD3 versus like a sizer or something like that, or, uh, or um, different like uh, CPU instructions that might be different on some numbers. This is uh, a good point, yes. That, that, is, uh, that is a factor. The idea was if a command like TR runs 50 times faster on my machine than another yeah, thing. Yeah, if it's a thousand times the magnitude, I don't yeah. think it matters much about that. Right. Uh, now, when we get down to small uh, differences of speed, then uh, the type of file system, uh, other factors, yeah. uh, number of cores, the size of your CPU, cache, and things like that could easily come into play and, and tip it one way or another. Okay. But with the, with the script, you can benchmark it on your system and see what your numbers turn out to be, and then base your decisions on that. OK. This actually came out of a real life uh, situation that was actually in Akron. I'm not allowed to say where. But if I said the name, you would know. Uh, a business had a database, and log files would accumulate in the source file. They were about 100 megabytes. They were compressed to about 40. And the system was overworked to the point where it was having trouble keeping up with the, the daily uh, demands of the business. And so this line right here, what it does, is it finds the command, or it finds the file, sucks it up into the CPU, compresses it, puts it back down where it was, and then uh, 
takes it and moves it to the other destination. And so we have read, write, read, and then write. And this approach, what, and this, this was very similar to the approach I used to, to fix the problem. Read the file, compress it on the fly, and drop it in the destination directly. I cut out a considerable amount of, of uh, file I.O. and that was enough of a difference that the machine was easily able to keep up with the demands of the business after that. But just something as simple as that, <coughs> whoever set it up originally wasn't thinking in terms of what am I asking this, this system to do? Because whenever you have a, a situation where I'm reading a big file, writing a big file, reading a big file, I'm saturating that disk subsystem's file uh, I/O buffers. But if I read once, compress, write, then everything is is easier for the system. This came out of another customer. That's almost word for word out of their script. That's what they wanted to do. They wanted to copy, make a copy of this file into that, sort that into file three, and then look at file three and wreck uh, something and end up with file four. All right, we've got all sorts of file right over there. This other alternative does it all in one pass. There's no unnecessary reading, no unnecessary writing. And this ran a lot faster than the other. Okay, we have some audience participation. Um, we have two ways of doing something. It's generating numbers from 1 to 10 to 100,000. The yes command is outputting the character Y, U line, Y, U line, so forth, forever. The cat command with the minus N option is taking each line that yes gets it and is adding some, a few spaces and then the first line is going to number one, it's going to number the lines as it come through. This command is going to uh, delete the Y character as it goes by. And that command is going to li limit the output to 100,000 lines. Both do, they both output exactly the same. So how do you know which one is faster? Bottom one. Okay. Why do we say that? Because it's only looking for a yes. And then That's right. This, if we compare the amount of data that's going on, Okay. These two pipelines are seeing the same data. These two pipelines are seeing the same data. There's different data here. And this, if we delete that Y up front, all we have is a string of new lines there. We have absolutely minimized the amount of data going through that pipeline. And that's why we have the speed data. Now, we saw